It's my hair. Beautiful. Skin is amazing. Yours is, I uh, mean, it's like just not a hair out of place. But I don't even dye it. <laughs> I don't either. I think we have about the same amount of gray. Yeah. Lucky. My mom, when she passed. Welcome to Get Busy Living with Clark Bartram. Man, I'm excited for today's episode. I got a good buddy in studio with me today who many people would look at and go, man, I want to be that guy. I want to live that life. I want to just suit up and slam somebody into the ground. (laughs) So this gentleman is a Super Bowl champion winning linebacker with the San Francisco 49ers, Mr. Gary Plummer. What is up, my brother? Thanks for having me. The, The great thing is... You're keeping me off of my HOA slope today because I've been planting succulents on the slope for about three months and, you know, working out Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then going out there. I'm like, man, I'm not recovering like I usually do. So, so. you get so- more sore from succulents on a slope <laughs> than you did sacking quarterbacks uh, in the NFL? No, I can't say more sore, but uh, I'm older now. I'm, you know, I'm an old man. I'm 63 now. So when did you, like, how long removed are you from the NFL now? How many years? 1998. So I have to do the, do the math there. I think that's like 25 years. Can you believe you're 62 years old now? 63. 63. Yeah, don't take that away from me. <laughs> <laughs> 63. In your mind, so I want young guys to understand, like a young Pop Warner kid, you know, the, the high school linebacker that's the badass right now. He's walking around school. You know the energy. And he's thinking, man, 63 is old. That is old. Absolutely. I'm never going to be that old. Can you remember being that guy and thinking that people 63 were like near death? I can remember my dad uh, retired as a cop after 30 years. He was 55 years old. And I remember thinking, I don't even know if I want to live that long. That's just old. And it, it's really interesting that you asked that question because uh, I'll be speaking to a group of high school athletes uh, next month in Arizona. And, you know, those are some of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, ironically, 40 years ago, two days ago, it was in Facebook. Somebody posted the USFL first game ever played was the Arizona Wranglers against the Oakland Invaders, which I was a part of. And for 40 years, it hit me and I, I got nostalgic and I called my linebacker coach that I was just hoping to make the team as a 23-year-old undrafted punk. And four days before that opening game, the coach came up to me, Coach Mike Halachek, and he said, Congratulations, not only did you make the team, you're starting this week. Wow. And my eyes got this big, and I was wondering what the heck is going on. What do you mean? I I don't know if I'm ready. And he (laughs) said, trust me, you're ready. And so I called him. I called him three days ago. He lives back in Florida. And I said, uh, we called him Coach Hack. I said, Hack, I just want you to know that uh, I really appreciate that you believed in me. And had I not had somebody like you, I might not have made it, you know, and then, the, you know, the the whole thing went back and forth. It was really emotional. So uh, those are things that I didn't think about, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But uh, yeah, you, kind of, you get older and you get nostalgic. Yeah, man. 40 years ago? 40 years that ago. That game was 40 years ago. Yeah. That blows my mind yeah. how quickly time flies. So you said a lot of good stuff in there that we could unpack. Let's talk about the USFL first because... I've seen a lot of your stuff, right? Your football cards from the NFL. I think the coolest thing, honestly, is the USFL because that was when the USFL was, it's back now for the second or third time. Correct. But you played in the USFL when it was brand new, when nobody thought it was going to be anything. But there were a lot of just gangsters that played in that league. Absolutely. Herschel Walker, Doug Flutie, um, Steve Young, uh, Steve Young, uh, Gary Plummer, Reggie White. Yeah. Oh, I man. mean, guy, Hall of Fame guys. And uh, that's what they did. They went after Hall of Fame, not Hall of Fame. They went after Heisman Trophy winners back then. Uh, another guy that won the Heisman Trophy, you probably don't remember, Mike Rozier. Oh, yeah. Played for the Pittsburgh Maulers. And, uh, you know, it was it was such a great league. And the reason it was great is there were a bunch of rejects that, you know, from the NFL 
that maybe played two or three years and got cut. There were a bunch of guys like me that didn't get drafted. And, you know, there were a few marquee players. But the difference was guys wanted to be there. Guys were willing to do whatever it took to make it because this was their shot. I think guys come out of college and hey, I'm too good to play special teams. I, I'm, I was a superstar in high school and a super superstar in college. So uh, I'm just going to walk around like a prima donna. There weren't any of those guys. And so, uh, and, and there was, there were the rules in the USFL were a lot different. I mean, basically you could grab a guy by, by the face mask and throw him down. You could try and rip his nutsack off. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't matter. So I can remember my first game here when I was with the Chargers three years later after the USFL folded I was a little bit nervous to start a game and the D-line coach came up to me the late Gunther Cunningham who ended up being the head coach of the Chiefs for a while and he said you're gonna find out those guys in the USFL were much nastier than these guys in the mm. NFL these guys are kind of soft they're just gonna push you around and trying to get you in your way and I thought wait a second this is the USF this is the NFL this is you know so it should be a step up I couldn't believe it I mean I was like crushing guys in the NFL because it just seemed like they were coasting and for the same reasons they were probably superstars in college got drafted in you know the first or second round and they've been starting the NFL for five years and you know so it gave me a great perspective to never ever get comfortable so that's kind of like the rich kid getting everything handed to him like these NFL guys that come out of college and right so being hungry is a good thing Absolutely. This might get you in trouble, but I know you don't care because I know you and you're so far removed from the game now. What do you think of the NFL today? Is it soft? Is it, <laughs> is it, you've been waiting to answer this question. That, oh my gosh. Well, I, I went up a few years ago when Kenny Norton, uh, who's now. Yeah, at, he wanted you to coach with him, right? He, he wanted me to coach with the Seahawks. And I went to a mini camp, three day mini camp. And, uh, you know, so I was coaching guys up a little bit and in meetings and, you know, guys just weren't very attentive out on the field and in the classroom. And they kind of look at you like, what the hell do you know, old man? And then to watch guys get picked up after practice by their personal assistants, I was like, what the hell is going on here? So Kenny knows best because he, he ended up coaching with Pete Carroll at USC for a long time. Then he coached with Pete Carroll up there in Seattle forever. Uh, so he's been around it and he's continuing to coach now. And he said, the athletes today are marginally better, a little faster, a little quicker, a little bigger, a little stronger. They do not know the game of football. He said, trust me, his Super Bowl Dallas teams and the 49er Super Bowl team, he said, we can kick the crap out of these guys nowadays. So, so they just dumbed it down to make it look like these guys are better than... Because if you watch NFL films, like Mitch will often say, my son, oh man, those guys couldn't play today. But I disagree with that because a lot of the older guys from your era and before are just badasses, man. They're tough. You think of the Buckuses and, and guys like that, they're yeah. just mean people that's exactly right you know and, and the rules would be tougher to play with today um, because I realized that I wasn't running you know stride for stride with uh, Barry Sanders so I'm going to try and knock him out at the line of scrimmage before he ever gets downfield um, and that's just the, the way the game has changed it's you know offense centric uh, people want to see high scoring games uh, but Trust me, there were some unbelievable athletes that, you know, Jerry Rice, Deion Sanders. I mean, guys, Barry Sanders. Yeah, I mean, list off the names uh, of some of the people. Who's, uh, who's the, like, most legendary person you ever tackled? Oh, I, I, I would say Bo Jackson. Really? Um, because that guy, had he not gotten hurt, he was unbelievably strong. He was 
amazingly quick and oh by the way ran a 4.19 40 yard dash why don't they don't bring that up in the combine ever they yeah. always talk about Dion and his 423 yeah. or whatever it yeah. was but Bo Jackson ran a four like a legitimate 4 one yeah, at four at, at you yeah, have 230 pounds um, and it fortunately it didn't happen too often but occasionally it did and I'll never forget playing against the Raiders up there at the Coliseum and it was a stretch play and so I'm trying to get outside as fast as I can and get across the block and I do that and all of a sudden you know I I have to turn on the speed to get uh, to to get to him and all of a sudden he makes a cut and all I saw was this Nike swoosh going right over my face. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I literally fell on my butt. Uh, you know, he was just absolutely unbelievable uh, in terms of being strong, fat. I'm mean, just the total package. Yeah, it's one thing for a lineman to tackle him, right? But as he builds up speed and he gets to the next level, he gets to linebackers, there's more inertia and energy coming out. You imagine those... 200, 190, 180 pound safeties in the background seeing this monster yeah. coming full steam ahead. I can imagine a lot of guys would just go, you know what? <laughs> even even that wimpy linebacker from Oklahoma who oh, got yeah. drafted early on. Uh, who am I trying Bosworth? to think of? Yes, yes. Ba, <laughs> the boss getting run over by him. Um, so, I mean, other guys, Reggie White, they still talk about Reggie White and the hump move. You know, that was how you could literally see him lift up. He'd get out a hand under the armpit of an offensive lineman and he'd just lift him up. And uh, uh, they called it the hump move. It was to this day, I don't know how he did it. And a guy that just recently made uh, the Hall of Fame, Bryant Young, 6'4. 297 pounds, ran a 4640, bench pressed a house. Hand to God, I get in a fight in a game against Cincinnati. I know that shocks you that I get in a fight <laughs> on the field. And, you know, so I've got the guy by the face mask and 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 you know he knocks my hand off and all of a sudden a hand comes over my shoulder pad and grabs this dude. 300 pound lineman by the face mask rips the face mask off the helmet off doesn't the- rip the helmet <laughs> and the face mask. just you know how those things are attached it's physiologically impossible and i saw it with my own eyes one of the coal buckets for arms and the nicest calmest off the field guy you ever met in your life bryant young wow it's so let's talk about that mindset because you had mentioned something earlier when you got called up to play in the USFL. You said, I don't know if I'm ready. And then him being a nice guy off the field, but a beast on the field. What sort of mindset shift do you have to have in order to do that and be that guy and step up when they call your number? It's like, hey, because I can remember Todd Marinovich. There was something on ESPN about him or 30 for 30 where you know he's out partying all night and then the coach looks at him and he's like you're going in he's like I'm not going and yeah. I talked to him once he said I wasn't ready yep. cuz I wasn't prepared so so in that particular instance when coach Halachek said you're going to start um, he said trust me you're ready and I'm going to work with you and make sure you're ready so that that was extremely important so having someone believe in you and Absolutely. tell you yeah. But before that, you and I have spoken many times to juvenile detention facilities, and I've told this story. Uh, But when I was at Cal, when I was walking on, coaches don't want you to make it as a walk-on because you make them look bad that they're – you know, they, they didn't find you. And also, uh, they've spent all this time, effort, and money on these recruits and, of course, giving them a scholarship you make them look bad if the scholarship guys aren't playing. So I was there for about three weeks, and all of a sudden they said, hey, we've got a lot of linebackers, and we don't have many defensive linemen. We're going to move you to nose tackle. I mean, Literally, for years I'd been too small to play linebacker in the Pac-10, and now they want to move center to the, the line. <laughs> yeah, to nose tackle where I'm supposed to be 275, somewhere around there. And I had never played, you know, the D-line in my life. I remember lining across from this guy named David Paws, who was a scholarship offensive lineman. He was one year behind me. He was a sophomore. 
and he wasn't a starter. But they line me up, and he's going to uh, snap the ball to the coach, who is an offensive line coach, uh, just standing in the shotgun. So I, I didn't even know what I was doing, Clark. I said, you know what? I have no idea, but I'm so angry right now, so pissed off. Somebody's going to pay. And I got in a four-point stance. I didn't even know how to get lined up. <laughs> I mean, I look like a frog this high <laughs> off the ground. And that dude snapped the ball. I exploded out of my stance, hit him with the top of my helmet right under his chin, literally knocked him on the back of his helmet, ran over the top of him, and I ran over that goddamn coach that was sn- catching the ball. Everybody stopped practice and oohed and awed. And said, holy crap. We found a nose tackle. <laughs> and I literally became the starting nose tackle three days later because in the spring game, I pl- I said to myself after that play, I will never play another down of football without harnessing that kind of intensity. I was always a good player and I thought I was pretty intense. It was a whole new level. And I, I know that's the difference. That's what made me... Uh, the player that I was and a stubborn bastard that would never give up and continue to play for 15 years on the pros. I introduced you the other day on my Zoom call and I said you played 18 years and I missed a really good joke. I missed a really good joke. You said, Clark, I played 15. I'm like, no, no, Gary, you played 18. You just forgot the other three because of all (laughs) all the CTEs. (laughs) But intensity is something that is super important in every aspect of life. And we always hear what we learn in sports carries over into life. Mm -hmm. How has what you learned in sports carried over into your life, personal, relational, and every other thing, right? Putting succulents on a slope. Because I know that is a therapy that you use because you've had head injuries throughout the years. And that's a big topic. Kind of want to segue into that. Before we segue into... CTEs. I want to cut to a little commercial here with a couple companies that I'm fortunate to work with. So we'll be right back. I've got a question for you and I want you to answer this honestly. When was the last time you had a detailed blood test done? Like really going deep into your blood and finding out some of the things that might be going on. Now let me share something with you really quick here. I coach men, right? I coach men all around the world. And the number one thing I hear from men when I ask them, when was the last time you had your blood work done is, I don't know, four or five years. Listen, the older we get, the more important it is for us to find out what can only be found out in our blood. So I've made an opportunity for you to get a detailed blood panel through a relationship that I have with a company called Merrick Health. Now, I've vetted these people out for you. I use it myself. Matter of fact, I just went this morning and had my blood tested, got the little prick right there in my vein. And the reason I do this is not just to find out where I'm at in health things like testosterone levels and other hormones that are vitally important that we don't talk about as men, but nutritionally, like where am I at? What is my body lacking? Where do I need help at? So knowing is better than closing your eyes and acting like if you don't pay attention to it, that it's not going to be there. You really need to understand that this is important. And the reason you would want to use a company like Merrick Health, in my opinion, my experience has shown me when I go to my GP and I say, hey, can I get my T levels checked? Can I get this checked? This is what my doctor said to me last time. We don't do that. Why do you want those numbers checked? It doesn't matter. I'm not going to let my doctor tell me what doesn't matter. I know what matters to me. So that's why I want you to go check out Merrick Health, man. Don't be this knucklehead guy that says, oh, I don't need to do it, or I'm not going to go get checked because I don't want to find out if anything's wrong with me. That is a horrible way to think. You're going to save 10% by using the code MAXIMIZEDMAN. All of the information is below on the show notes. I want you to go right now and check it out. I have made a detailed panel for you called the Maximized Man Panel that will give you everything that myself and the doctor agree you should get. And when you get it, you're going to have a consultation. You're going to be well taken care of because trust me, man, this is an area of your life that you need to pay attention to. So go check out the show notes, click on the button, save 10% right now, and possibly save your life. 
All right, welcome back. So before we get to the CTE stuff, which I think is super important, I actually went to a full body scan the other day and they said, oh, you had a concussion. I'm like, I don't remember getting a concussion. And I can imagine that's a big part of it. But intensity and applying it to life. What are some lessons that anyone could take away, whether it's a young person that's playing sports, someone in their marriage that's trying to push through, someone that's trying to make it in business? It applies to everything. Yeah. I think uh, intensity, probably the opposite of complacency. When I think of somebody that's complacent, I think lazy, I think average. And now, clearly, there's a reason that there's a lot of average out there. Because that's exactly what it means. It means the the majority of people are average. And I don't know what it is about my genetic makeup. I know it's the exact same thing with you. Average to me seems like the top of the crap heap. <laughs> it just it just did. And I never wanted to be average at anything. And it started when I was 10 years old delivering papers. I wanted to throw the paper from my bike and have it leaning against the front door. And and if it didn't, ah, damn it, you know? And so it was just always part of my genetic makeup. But I found that so many times in my life, I early on, I wasn't good as good as other people. And it pissed me off. And so I just worked on whatever it was and that's really what what carried me throughout my entire life. No matter what it was, um, it it was just okay. I was able to walk on at the University of California at Berkeley, work, which nobody does while they're playing football and compete in one of the most stringent academic institutions in the country. I, I, I was able to refer to that so many times in my pro career or working with my brother in construction in the off seasons because I didn't make enough money early in my career. And two weeks in, I, I'm, a, I'm a, land, a laborer for my brother's company and this, the superintendent uh, comes up to me and said, Gary, you know, you're, you're making 12 bucks an hour. We're going to give you a raise to $18 an hour. And I was looking around two weeks in. That's a big jump. <laughs> it was huge. I, I mean, this is 1983 or 1984. What I was doing, Clark, is I was taking a wheelbarrow into a building. There was a bank and, and the subfloor. And uh, they wanted to get rid of this giant planter that was bigger than this room. And I had to take this you know, wheelbarrow down there. I had to dig out the dirt, fill up the wheelbarrow, go up the elevator, take it out into the, um, out into the parking lot, dump it. And, you know, it was supposed to take me like a month. And I think I got done with it in two weeks. And this guy was like, I have never seen anyone work like you. I'm like, dude, there's only one way to work. It's pedal to the metal. Like, why do it if you're not going to try and be your best? So it was just, I, I think I've been so fortunate to have so many great coaches. I mentioned Coach Halachek. There was Ron Lynn, who coached in the NFL for 28 years. Um, Bobby Ross, when he was here with the San Diego Chargers. George Seifert up there uh, with the San Francisco 49ers. And just on and on and on. And you took one piece of each one of those guys. You know, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse because most of the guys around you are getting better. That resonated with me. And you'd, you know, you'd hear it all the time from different coaches. And, and I, I just kind of have a reel of them in my head. And if there was ever any adversity in my life, I just think, what would that coach say? I was listening this morning on TikTok or Instagram talking about how to coach people. With all of the coaches that you've had, what was the best style of coaching? Did you appreciate where they pointed out what you did right or got on you for what you did wrong? Both. Absolutely. I think today we're all about the positivity. I think it's BS. Hmm. I think I think this world is going to chew you up and spit you out if you think that you're not going to face adversity. There's one thing we all have in common. It's adversity. 
The difference between success and failure is how you handle that adversity. And so coaches are testing you. Good yeah. teachers are testing you. Good trainers. You know, I, of course, if, if, if you're training, uh, you know, a 55-year-old woman at the gym that's just starting, you're not going to hammer her. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it doesn't work. But you figure out who handles what and if you're in a place like the NFL, as a coach, I'm thinking to myself, hey, if this guy doesn't want to do it my way, you're done. Get out of here. <laughs> and that's what freaked me out about going up there to Seattle because guys were kind of skirting the edges. You know, Bobby Wagner just made, you know, $55 million of the extension when he left the Seahawks. And I was coaching him up and I was saying, Bobby, I, I don't think you're aggressive enough. Mm. I don't think that you come up. Yeah, you make a lot of tackles, but they're three, four, five yards down the field. Let's say it's three yards. Well, guess what? Three yards, four times is a first down. I need you making tackles up there at the line of scrimmage. And the only way you can do that is by shooting your shot, get downhill. And, and I see a lot of that in the NFL today. I see a lot of guys making a ton of tackles, but they're, they're kind of slipping and sliding instead of playing smash mouth football. That's why I think a team like the Cowboys, a team like the 49ers could compete with today's teams uh, because you just play smash mouth and there are a lot of teams that can't, can't uh, weather that storm. Man, there's so much in this. So with the styles of coaching, you know, I think too often we think we need to choose one way or the other. Like, I love that you immediately said both. Like, both. They're both necessary. It's almost like a diet. People say, well, veganism or cannibalism or all these different styles of eating. I don't think any one of them is right, but I don't think any one of them is wrong. We could take something sure. from each one. Like, yes. okay, you're a vegan. There's a lot of plant nutrients and stuff that we could eat. So take out the fish and leave the bones. Same with coaching and intensity and all that sort of stuff. You'd mentioned playing at Cal. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the band on the field. <laughs> One of the most iconic college football games ever played in the history. I watched it on NFL films or something the other day. What was that like to be in that game? We talked about it before, but for everyone listening today. I, it was experiences like that, Clark, that, that gave me that never-say-die attitude for the rest of my life. Yeah, because everyone thought it was over. The absolutely. game was done. The band was on the field. <laughs> everyone was celebrating. Whether it was yeah. that he was down by contact on his knee or not, the game wasn't over. Yeah, the, a guy just wrote a book on it um, because it's the 40-year anniversary, um, I think was last year. And it was truly remarkable. I can remember being just depressed. I was sitting, you know, on the sideline with a guy named Reggie Camp who got drafted in the second round, played seven years for the Cleveland Browns, and we're shaking our heads and saying, I can't believe we lost our last college football wow. game this way because John Elway had taken his team in less than two minutes, uh, 87 yards, to go down the field and score a touchdown to take the lead. And ah, it was just devastating until – and I didn't know this was going on, but one of my roommates in college was pulling guys off the sideline because some coaches had quit. Mm. They just thrown down their headset, and uh, there were only nine. It ended up there were 10 guys on the field, but at one time there were only eight on the kickoff return team. They weren't the kickoff return team. They were just guys that were getting pulled off. Yeah, because the guy that made the tackle wasn't even supposed to be on the field. Yes. He's the yes. one that wrote the book. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it. I mean, it's been it was crazy, and and you know to experience or scored the it, touchdown. You the guy, scored yeah, the touchdown. Scored the yes. Touchdown. Um, and and so I can remember being in a in a playoff game, and we were down, you know, by twenty seven points in the fourth quarter with four minutes to go, and I'm screaming at teammates, you know, God, this game not over, and people are looking at me like I'm crazy, but I never lost that thought because of that experience. And I think if you're that total positivity parent or teacher or coach that, that doesn't uh, subject people to reality, 
what life has a lot of heartaches, then how do they respond when they face adversity for the first time? If you're a helicopter slash snow plow, plow parent and this kid of yours, you know, you've sent them to the best schools and, and, you know, you were the homeroom parent and then he gets this great job. And then all of a sudden, you know, he gets a boss that, you know, isn't, you know, one of those guys that's going to massage you. He's an in your face guy. How do you handle that? I don't know that a lot of kids can, if they haven't experienced it before. Yeah. That's a whole different topic altogether right there. We, we could get into that and sideline. But I think people are really into this whole football on the field experience type of energy. So before we segue into the whole CTE thing, which I know is big and something that you're a pioneer of, really, in my opinion, as to what you can do to overcome some of the adverse effects of all of the impact you've took, taken over the years, what are a couple other things that you remember from playing that you just love that maybe you've never shared before, like oh, one gosh. moment in time. So let me ask this real quick. John Elway, you played against him in college, right? And then you played against him in the pros. What do you say, like after you sack him and you're getting up, for, and, and it's just that moment between the two of you. What are the, some of the conversations and words that you have? <laughs> I actually have a great photo at home of the two of us, and he's a big dude. Uh, he's like 6'4". So uh, I'm not exactly face to face, you know, I may, might be looking up at him a little bit, but uh, he had, he had run out of bounds and he was a great scrambling quarterback. I had chased him out of bounds and, you know, I might've, I might've nudged, nudged him out him of a little bounds. bit What he got and, flagged for it in, in this end. Yes. <laughs> and, and they, and they didn't throw the flag and he started bitching to the umpire and I turned around, I said, you punk ass bitch, you have not stopped bitching since 1982 when we you know, ran through your sorry ass band. And oh my God, he just, he was so livid. And the next series that we had after that, he was terrible because you know you got into his head. And so those are some of the things that, that really stick out to me. I can remember playing against the New Orleans Saints and... Um, I'm screaming out on every play because there aren't a lot of nuclear physicists on the field. <laughs> so some guys have unbelievable talent physically, but mm, they might not know their assignment. I don't care how big, strong, and fast you are. If you don't know your assignment, you're no good. So we had a guy that was a rookie. I literally had to line him up on every play, tell him his responsibility, and then when they lined up Clark, because I, that, that's what I had to do. I wasn't the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, the quickest. So, you know, you had to be the smartest out there. So, you know, a personnel group comes out. Let's call it two tight ends, one back, two wide receivers. Automatically in my mind, I'm start starting to calculate what they're going to do on second and seven. And then I see the, the formation uh, once they line up. Now... I have about a 90% certainty what's going to happen. Then I look at their offensive linemen and the splits and, you know, which way the guy's leaning. Now I'm about 97% sure what's going to happen. I call out the play. Lee Woodall, jab OT, coming your way, coming your way. Four plays in a row, and I call them out perfectly. And this guy named Dombrowski, who was a, you know, he was a beast of an offensive line, like 325, and he goes... Ref, I don't know what the hell's going on, but this MFer's got our playbook. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so so I just, I mean, you know you're in his head now. So now you change up. Instead of doing an Olay technique to a big guy, I'm going to put my six-inch forehead right under his chin because he's looking for me to slip him. And so... Uh, he's, he, he, it's a, it's a toss sweep and he's coming around and he's, you know, some guys will cut you, but then big guys like that will just try and run over you. And I plant my chin right underneath his, uh, my forehead right underneath his chin and I make the tackle and we're walking back to the huddle. And all of a sudden he catches up to me. He goes, Jesus Christ, you have a steel plate in your forehead, dude. <laughs> so, you know, there were a lot of fun things like that, but one of the things that you realize is that that mental aspect of the game, not only knowing your stuff, but also figuring out whose head you can get 
into, who who skin you can get under. Some guys you don't want to piss off. Right. So you want to let a sleeping dog lie. For example, playing against the uh, the Cowboys twice uh, in, in the same season, once in the regular season, once in the NFC Championship. They had an offensive lineman named Nate Newton who weighed 385 pounds. Don't piss off Nate Newton. Mm. That dude was as quick as a cat at almost 400 pounds, but he was pretty soft and he couldn't go 100% on every down. I like that about him. <laughs> you just keep going, you just keep cruising, and and but he would come out about eight to 10 plays a game and you knew when he came out and he was giving it 100%, Essentially, you there's no way to fight that. So you had to pick and choose whose skin you were going to try and get under. Yeah, some coach probably lit him up on the sideline and said, come on, Nate, you got more than this. What's going on? That guy's owning you. Yeah. He's half your size. What's your problem? He gets yeah. all riled up. Then he gets lazy. Yeah. Isn't that was actually fun, too, is that early on in games, uh, you know, because being fit was was a key for, for me. And it's hard to believe for a guy that's made a living like you on being fit, that there are guys in the NFL that are just naturally beasts and they don't work out hard. And so I would say, you know, there's a pretty even split between guys with unbelievable talent that don't work hard, guys with, you know, mediocre talent that work okay. And then guys like me who had, you know, probably not very good talent, but just worked harder than everyone else. And to me, it was such an advantage. First quarter, stalemated with a lot of guys. Maybe that offensive lineman, that running back might have won a few battles. Starts evening out in the second quarter. I start winning most of the battles in the third quarter and I could guarantee it didn't matter who we played in the fourth quarter I was going to dominate whoever I was playing across from because I was in better shape than them and that was that was something that gave me tremendous confidence and I think that's a key to all your listeners out there is that find out what you know what you can do I didn't know I didn't know that that was going to be the key to my success maybe being stubborn was the biggest key but for me, it was being in better shape than everyone else. That's huge. I mean, being conditioned, right? Because as the game goes on, so that goes back to the genetic, epigenetic argument. It's like 20% of people's ability, guys, you've seen this more than anyone. You see a guy who's genetically gifted, but lazy as hell. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, if I had half that guy's talent, I would be a beast because I know yes. my work ethic, yes. which is the epigenetic or the lifestyle part of it. it. It amazes me that people don't understand that. If they could put those things together and just be a beast. And then you put the mindset piece on top of that. Like I think of Dion as one of those guys that has all of that, right? He had the genetic ability. He had the work ethic. And then he's got the mindset, too, to walk into a room and go, I own this room. I got this. And I love something he said, don't let my confidence offend your insecurity. That's how much he knows. He's just a straight badass. Yeah. And he, whether or not he got owned on a play or not, he got up and was like, okay, let's go again. Because I'm going to win the game with you. you know? I, one of my all-time favorite teammates, and a lot of people would ask that question about Dion. You know, oh, is Dion a pain in the ass to play with? I'm like, no, why? Well, he just seems like, you know, he's all show. And when I told people that he had the video eight player, which is dating me all the way back in 1994, he was watching game tapes every time I saw him when we were on the road traveling to a game. He was watching the game tape after the game on the way home. He was a student of the game and it wasn't just about his you know, 4.21 40-yard dash. It was this guy knew the game, and uh, and he wanted to be as good as he could possibly be. It was fun. I, I think that's that's something that I take away from the NFL too. I, you like to surround yourself, and that's a recommendation to all your listeners as well. Surround yourself with good people, uh, people that that you can count on because. 
it's those people that you can look to. I've done it with you, you know, in terms of advice and, and what to eat, you know, as well as Chris Hemsworth and Limitless. You know, I've I've adopted some of those principles. Now, for some reason, my wife likes to watch videos of you and Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> like, what? With the door closed. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, t- it's taking bits and pieces of knowledge, like I said before, from coaches, but it can be from a, a coworker, a boss, a teacher. There are mentors out there that you don't even realize. And I think the reason for that is people don't often recognize opportunity because it becomes, it comes disguised as hard work. People don't oftentimes realize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. And I can remember that was, I don't remember now which coach it was, but that resonated with me as well. And, and so before I might not have seen an opportunity, I might've seen a roadblock, but you hear a coach say that and you're like, okay, maybe this is an opportunity. That's such good stuff, man. And if these coaches could have the benefit of knowing that you're still quoting them 30, 40 years later. It's such an honor, right, to be so far down the road in your life and be able to reflect back on someone that had input into your life. And you have that as well. There's someone quoting you somewhere. There's someone, I mean, you're here with me right now because I have that much respect for you. When we come back, we're going to talk about a teammate of Gary's that I know will probably bring tears to his eyes, but we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. The number one thing I think that has helped me stay lean at 59 years old is being prepared with my food. I always hear guys say, when I ask them the question, what did you eat today? Well, you know, I had to run through a drive through I didn't have anything to eat. I travel a lot, so I don't get good food. Icon Meals has been the thing that has saved my life and so many of my friends when it comes to anything as far as having your meals prepped. They taste good. They show up fast. And you can save 10% right now by using the code Clark. Trust me, I want you to head over to iconmeals.com. Check out all of the beautiful menus. They have the bulk box. They have the lean box. They have the keto box. They have something for everybody. If you're a vegan, you could go on and custom order the food that you want. You can custom order the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrates. Custom make a box or have them send one for you. Once again, use the code Clark. Go to Icon Meals right now, save 10%, and get free shipping. Okay, so you talked about being a smart player. You talked about being an intense player. You talked about being someone who works hard. I think a name that comes to mind that you had the opportunity to play with is Junior, Junior Seau. So that I want to lead into this discussion of CTEs and your experience with him. Let's talk about some of the the more fun moments you had with Junior and then kind of lead into something that I think is a big topic today. So I remember early on with the Chargers, it was the tail end. So I came here in 1986 after the three years in the USFL. It was the tail end of the Don Coriel era uh, where those guys were, you know, some of the best teams of the late 70s, early 80s. And I'll be completely honest with you. There were a lot of older guys, and I say older now. You know, I thought these guys were ancient. They're 30, 32 years old. So, you know, there's, Charlie Joyner worked extremely hard. Kellen Winslow had unbelievable talent. Jeez. Um, they were all there when you came yeah, to the Chargers. Dan yeah. Fouts. Dan Fouts knew the game better than anyone I think I have ever played with. But there were a lot of dudes that did the brother-in-law technique in practice. And that is simply, you don't go hard and I'm not going to go hard to make each other not look bad on game tape. So that wasn't me. And I made a lot of enemies in those first two years. Plus you're coming from the USFL where it was harder. Yes. And so I only knew the one speed. So I can remember getting in, in arguments with coaches on the other side and, um, you know, screaming and yelling at them. Things changed when Junior Seau showed up 
and I think that was 1990 or 91. I can't remember. So it was 1990. I was 30 years old. He was 20, almost 21. I don't even wow. think he was 21 yet. That a fresh dude, junior sale right out of USC. He had only played 18 games in college. Wow. And because he came out early, he was one of those first guys that came out early. And this dude, there's no brother in law technique with junior sale hmm. around. He'll punch you in the mouth and he will just keep talking the entire practice. And so, even as a rookie, just as coming a rookie, in, oh yeah, with all those legends, didn't know his butt from a hole in the ground because he was a, an outside pass rusher. That's all he did is put his hand in the dirt, and they told him to get the quarterback. That was it, and so he didn't have to know anything. So now he's been moved to inside backer with us. So again, I'm having to coach him up before every play and stuff. But the intensity was unbelievable. Those old guys that were around from that previous regime hated Junior's guts. I was happy because now I got a I, I, I got, got an ally. <laughs> yes. So I remember a few weeks into training camp, it was lunchtime and Junior would disappear. I'm like, bro, where where are you going? He's like, I'm going to the weight room. Like, you you go to the weight room. We have, we got practice again later on. He's like, it's just what I do. I'm like, that's crazy. About three days later, I'm said, well, you know, the, the dude's a, he's a beast. Maybe I should try it. I started working out with Junior Seau, and I never missed another workout for the rest of the time that I was with the Chargers. During the season, we would go in there, and, I mean, this dude is doing 175-pound dumbbells for incline bench like Jeez. a hot knife through butter. Mm. And so I... I really credit Junior with extending my career because he made me young again. The intensity, you know, I mean, because I was hearing at that time the, the maximum genetic potential that a human being has is 28 or 29 years old. And I was 30 years old. And I'm like, wow, okay, I guess I'm supposed to be slowing down. When Junior came around, I started doing that. I noticed that when I went into games, because we'd lift, you know, we'd lift light on Monday as a recovery after a Sunday game. Tuesday, we'd uh, go in there and lift light. Um, but Wednesday and Thursday, we hit it hard. And then it was just like, you know, curls for the girls on Friday. They look good in your uniform. <laughs> um, but we would we'd work out before practice and so the first time i went into a game without working out before going you know the game i was fresh as a daisy i was like this is awesome wow. this is part of the fountain of youth that i found because of junior sale see that's a whole different topic right there you extended your career longevity how weightlifting is beneficial how buying in to these bs beliefs that after a certain age you can't do x y or Z, yeah. I cannot stand that. It drives yeah. me nuts because yeah. as a nearly 60-year-old guy, that's my message to men out there. Don't buy into the crap. You can boost your testosterone level naturally. You can increase your muscle. You can have confidence. You can lose weight. You can look great. You can do all of that, man. Anyway, so you and Junior are now teamed up. You guys are buddies. You're raising each other's game up. You're in your first game with him. What's it? I mean, what? What's some of the? I want to go in, in, like in those moments uh, that you don't see. He got kicked out of the game. The, the first really? game. It was against the Houston Oilers and the Oilers. I love uh, the Oilers. Yeah, the man. Houston Oilers. They had uh, a couple of All Pro offensive linemen. One of which was a former USC guy. And usually there's camaraderie. Both of them had gone to USC, clearly not at the same time. Uh, but it was one of the Matthews brothers. I mean, three brothers in the NFL. A father made it into the NFL. Actually, one of the sons made it into the NFL. Talk about genetics. Talk about genetics, yeah. And, you know, the, the this guy, I can't remember, Bruce Matthews, I think is who it was on the Oilers. And, uh, the Junior, Clay Matthews? Yes. Descendants he was or, the yeah. older brother. Uh, who also played at USC. And, you know, Junior was just talking smack to this dude the whole game, and I'm thinking, that dude's a beast. You, that's one of those sleeping dogs you let lay. But it was uh, late in the game, and they went to kick a field goal, 
and missed it, but Junior Seau did that leverage thing that's against the rules, which is to, you know, use your hands to jump up over the center, you know, and he didn't block the ball. But because of that, they got to move up five yards. The guy made the kick. We lose the game. Uh, so that's one of the early memories of Junior. But um, I can also remember my coaches, the same ones that were in the USFL that believed in me there, had come down here. And they were the coaches, the D-line coach, uh, the linebacker coach, and the defensive coordinator. And they said, Gary, you you need to line Junior up on every down and tell him his responsibility. And, um, you know, the big joke with Junior is that he made more tackles. He would grade out, and this is something that he knew that he did, and he would laugh at it, because he'd grade somewhere in the 60s, you know, and really you're supposed to be grading in the 90s if you have a good game. But the dude would make five big plays. And, you know, coaches are like, well, if you're going to if you're going to, you know, get a fumble recovery, you're going to get a sack and you're going to get an interception by running through on the backside when uh, a gap when you're supposed to be in the front side B gap. Well, then I guess we're going to let you do it. Um, I, I cannot tell you how many times junior was in the weak side flat when he's supposed to be in the strong side hook and of course if you're a quarterback you understand he's just from alignment yes yeah. it, just from the alignment <laughs> okay this guy's gonna be here this guy's gonna be here and you know unbeknownst to them that guy where'd that guy come from flying in from my blind side i yeah. have no idea and, and his intensity was just unparalleled and his energy uh was it was infectious and and truly uh there was a quote actually he was the head coach at that time marty schottenheimer he said i don't know what's happened to gary Plummer, but somebody has injected that guy wow. with the fountain of youth and it was junior sale i love that man that that just goes to show back to your point of the people you surround yourself with absolutely are either going to level you up or bring you down that's why i love being around you because i get fired up man i've got chills <laughs> and all this stuff now i want to go out and throw the football and run and jump and play and do all of that so why did he get kicked out of the game i'm interested to know what did he so do that's illegal it, oh it, they, he got kicked out for that yeah yeah oh um but that's I, extreme uh what no he didn't get he didn't that's right he didn't get kicked out for that i'm sorry i didn't finish the okay. story so clay not clay it was bruce matthews Hall of Famer, um, he started talking crap. He's a very quiet guy. He started t talking crap to Junior after that. Oh, boy. Because Junior, you know, ah, you stupid. He was just going at him. And Rookie, well, you dummy, well deserved. You yes. Yeah. And June Bug took a swing at him. And they threw him out of the game. So, um, yeah, that was just one of many stories about Junior. But it was even in practice um, I learned how I think I was a, a pretty boisterous guy even before Junior came around. But, you know, th that confidence that he had as a as a young guy to be talking crap to these guys that had been around with the Chargers forever, you know, that were all pros for all these years. He didn't care. Yeah. They're like, look, I'm here now. I'm the real deal and you're going to find you're going to figure that out. So uh it was a I have a a few favorite guys that I played with and definitely Junior is 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 front and center in most of those. Who would be the next one in line right after Junior? I'd say Kenny Norton. Um yeah, yeah Kenny Norton was uh he was a, a heck of a teammate. Uh, he didn't get the really, son of legendary boxer, yeah, three-time Super yeah. Bowl winner in a row. Then he's won two more as a coach. Um, a great story about intensity and manufacturing intensity. So we're gonna play in the NFC Championship game. Actually, it was in the tenth game of the season against the Cowboys. We were both at, at maybe we were nine and one at that point. So maybe it was the eleventh game. And uh, Kenny and I used to ride over from the team hotel to the to the game together. Uh, you know, his wife would drive his car, and so he didn't want to have an extra car. So I would always go into his room to, to get him, say, hey, it's time to go. And I walk in, and he had not been playing well. This is his first year. He's got a lot of different responsibilities pass-wise as the weak side inside linebacker. And so 
he'd been very hesitant. And if you're thinking in that game instead of reacting, you're no good. And so I walk in and I don't know where it came from, Clark, but I said, hey, Kenny, would you mind if um, I had my son wear your uniform today? You're like, what the, what are you talking about? I said, well, truthfully, you're playing like a punk ass bitch. Oh. And he looked at me and he said, what the fuck did you say? And I said it again. He's like, what the fuck? We've got a game to play and you're telling me this shit now? I said, well, truthfully, I wanted to tell you about four or five weeks ago, but I thought you'd pull your head out of your ass and start playing mm. like the Kenny Norton that I know. And I start ramping up my voice. And I'm like, look, you motherfucker. Can I say that on here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, look, you motherfucker. I said, you're so worried about your coverage responsibility. I promise you the first play of this game, it's going to be one of two plays. It's going to be the stretch play your way, or it's going to be a lead draw right at you. Because they saw the film. They're seeing the film. They're seeing how weak you are, mm. how soft you are. He literally picked up the lamp, wham, and throws it at me. I start laughing. I'm like, God, I'd wish you'd have that kind of intensity when we start playing. He fuck you, plumber. And we just start going at it. And I think the bill was 900 bucks of damage that we did. And so we don't talk to each other the entire way to, uh, to the game. Uh, it's maybe a 15-minute drive. We walk in. And I just happened to remind him in the huddle right before that wow. first play of the game, I said, they're running right at you, motherfucker. Guess what? They ran a stretch play right at him. He fucking came out. He didn't care about pass responsibility. He made the tackle for, you know, a half yard gain on Emmett Smith. And then he teabagged him. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's right, motherfucker. That's go. the Kenny Norton that I know. And that's the guy I want to play next to. Long story. We, you know, we win the game and, you know, he hugs me afterwards and says, hey, thanks. The next week he goes, hey, can you do that again? I'm like, hell no, that was too expensive. <laughs> but what we did do is I kind of incorporated it into what I used to do with one of my linebacker coaches. And he just happened to be walking by one day. And there, you know, I would hate to be a coach in the NFL because we get to release all that intensity. We get to release all that stress and pressure once the game starts. It's still on them. And, you know, these guys are are tighter than a drum. And my linebacker coach walks by and he's he's studying his little pamphlet that has all the tendencies. I'm like, oh my God, John. His name was Coach Marshall, John Marshall. I said, You don't know that shit yet? And he looks at me. I said, there's not one fucking thing on your sheet right now of tendencies with the Dallas Cowboys that you can ask me that I don't know. He goes, really? Okay, smart ass. And he asked me, what are they going to do on third and two from the 27-yard line in blue eye formation? <laughs> really, John? You're going to ask me that simple ass shit? Uh, you know, it's it's going to be a power right. Uh, and I just called out the play. He goes, okay, smart ass, what about this? And guys start paying attention. And they're like, holy shit, this guy knows what they're going to do before each down. So now you get the ear of a Lee Woodall and all these other guys. When I'm calling out a play, I'm not guessing. I'm telling you what's going to happen. And uh, that was one of the beautiful things. This is a great segue, too, and something that we haven't really talked about. When I was here with the San Diego Chargers, with Bobby Ross, it got better. But early on, we had four coaches in the eight years I was here. There were a lot of guys just happy to be here. But in San Francisco, guys said it's win the Super Bowl or bust. Mm. And to, to have that expectation was amazing. And it was in the first minicamp. We've told this story before at uh, the juvenile detention facilities. Jerry Rice, Rice catches a little five-yard slant, and his deal was that he was going to run it in for a touchdown no matter where they were at the, on the field. So we're about, you know. This is in our, practice. In practice, our own 27-yard line. 
he catches a five-yard slant, which means he's got to run almost 80 yards to get it into the end zone. Well, I was always taught you run to the ball and tag off on that ball carrier or try and punch it out on every down, even in practice. So I'm running and I'm running and I'm running. I don't know who else is, you know, coming after him. And Jerry Rice starts slowing down at about the five-yard line, allows me to catch up. I punch the ball out from behind. He looked at me. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and I just said, that's my job. Yeah. He goes, it'll never happen again. He became a better player because of that. Coaches ran. Well, it's a shame he assumed that 90 of the, the other guys weren't even chasing him. Yeah. You know what I mean? After that practice, they ran that play back 20 times. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was only 15 times. And they turn off the projector. That's how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. We had projectors then. And they turned the lights on and they said, in case you guys don't realize what's going on, this is why we brought this guy in here. This is why we wanted him on defense because you, we got our asses kicked on defense the last two years in the row, uh, you know, against the Dallas Cowboys. We need this kind of intensity. And if you're not doing this on every play, then you're wrong. And guys started practicing like that. And so to have that kind of impact is, you know, it, it's a, a feeling second to none. It's, you know, the old song, one bad apple, don't spoil the one good apple could make the whole bunch better too, right? Yeah. Like one guy coming on could impact 10 other guys on a team. And you talked about waking a sleeping giant. In the case of Kenny Norton Jr., that's a giant you want to wake up on your team yes. that you know is not playing up to potential. Yeah. And I think that's where friendship comes in. Oftentimes in life, we'll see a friend mm -hmm. who you know is struggling and not really living their life up to the potential. And it's okay for you to rattle his cage because that's really loving a friend. Absolutely. It's not being disrespectful. It's not, it's like, that's the ultimate form of love, in my opinion. Like seeing someone who's not doing what you know they should be doing and living the life that they should be. And that's why this podcast is Get Busy Living with Clark Bartram because so many people aren't living up to their abilities their dreams, their goals in life, and true friends are going to come in and go, you know what I noticed? I did that yesterday to a friend. He got his feelings hurt, and I called him up. I said, stop being a bitch, and then he reacted. I said, stop being a bitch. You're, you're, you're acting like a little boy right now, and you know. So by the time we got done with the conversation, he was thanking me because he got over his reaction. Yep. He got over his emotion, and he was a man. He stood up. He's like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to go ahead and fix that. I'm like, I don't want to be right. I want to be your friend and call you out on the things just like I would expect you to do for me. So, so obviously you are encouraging people out there to stay fit, to lift. Obviously, the, most guys don't have gyms like you have at your house, so you got to go to a gym. I see the starkest contrast every week because I work out twice a week with my wife at 24 Hour Fitness and twice a week at Miramar at the Marine Base. With a Navy SEAL. Dude, I get so pissed off at 24 Hour Fitness because everybody's on their phone or they're sitting on a machine um, doing nothing. And when I go to the base, I don't see, we call this one group of older gentlemen, uh, the hens, because one guy will be on a machine and five of them are standing around and they're just talking yeah. and doing nothing. I see none of that at the base. Guys get in, get out. And if, I, if a guy is on a machine and he's taking a break in between, if I ask a Marine, hey, you know, you mind if I jump in for a set? Yeah, sure. No problem. If I do that at 24 Hour Fitness... People right. look, I'm sitting here. Yeah. So that mindset, I think we're both blessed that I think guys in the military and guys that have played sports at a high level understand you're going to get coached up. Yeah. And that's what you were doing to your friend. You're just coaching them up. That's it. That's it. And you're probably going to get a yes, sir, from the Marine, even on the next level of respect and appreciation. So we keep toying around with this conversation about CTEs and, and all of that. Your first, have you ever been knocked out on the field? Never. Just never been knocked out. Have you ever knocked anyone out on the field? Yes. Okay. So I can imagine you talk about people standing around talking, a guy waking up from being 
concussed and knocked out. How many concussions in your estimation have you had? Now you're gonna you're gonna listen to this number and think, oh my God, there's no way. But when you understand what a concussion is and how the brain rattles around, it was Marvis, Marvis Frazier that explained it to me best, and I shared this with you before. The great boxer, son of Joe Frazier, he had a glass of ice, and it was in a glass, and he swirled around, and the ice hit the edge of the glass. And he said, this is your brain when it get, gets concussed. It hits your skull, and trauma happens. So that's why I call it a CTE. How many have you had in your entire career <clears throat> from grade one to grade three? So... I found out recently that that's kind of a misnomer as a term, grade one to grade three. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know uh, that. That I got a little bit more educated on it. It's so hard to determine what the a a concussion. Yeah, is there a bruise on your brain that they can? A concussion is a concussion is a concussion, and people can have some of the same effects from a grade one as being knocked out. So I guess that would be grade three, maybe back in the day. That's kind of how they correct. And so, you know, just to educate people, if you happen to hit your head getting out of the car and you see stars, that's a concussion. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you hit your head on a, on a door jam, you've fallen, whatever, uh, that, that's a concussion. You could get hit in the stomach and get a concussion or the shoulder, right? If your brain rattles enough. Um, I, I mean, don't know. you don't get hit in the head when you're in a car. Right, it's the whiplash it's that It's the happens. whiplash, right? Yes. So I could push you hard enough and concuss you sure. to it. Right. Sure, okay. something like that. Just um, trying to define it here so you really understand yeah. the amount of trauma that we're about to talk about that he's experienced. So recently, when I first came out with my number, I would say 95% of the people out there scoffed at, the, at my number. But then Brett Favre came out with almost the exact same number and they're like, Oh, okay. Brett Favre played quarterback. He wasn't taking on offensive linemen. Trust me, when I played against the Kansas City Chiefs and I took on their all-pro offensive linemen, put my head under his chin, I saw stars. And then, oh, guess who's running through the hole? 260-pound Nigerian (laughs) nightmare Christian Okoye. And when you tackle him, there's another one. So sometimes it would happen twice on the same play. I conservatively said five to ten. Five to ten concussions a game. I played 250 games in my career. Do the math, ladies and gentlemen. So... That five to ten a game for two hundred and fifty games totals up to be. I know you've done the number twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred concussed. But that that's <laughs> only in the pros. That doesn't right. include college. It doesn't include high school. Now there weren't as many back then because guys aren't as big, aren't as strong, aren't as fast. So they impact the collisions. Mass times acceleration equals force. That's why. So what was the test back then? Before you get into that, so ah! the, yeah, the test. <laughs> yes. Then compared to now was. So you get off on the field, uh, off off to the side of the field, wobbling, I, yeah, wobbling, wobbling, and you'd get, you know, you'd get grabbed by one of the team doctors and trainers, and they'd help you off the field, and then they'd sit you down, and they'd put up a finger, and they'd, well, first they'd ask you, do you know where you're, you, what's your name, you know where you're at, and then you know maybe what day of the week it was. That's a tough one. You play on Sunday, <laughs> um, so uh, and then. I can remember, once you realize what their test is, I can remember them saying, how many fingers am I holding up? And I'd say this many, (laughs) and I'd go run back out onto the field. Um, What I now know is so many times, we used to have bull in the ring, uh, which is one guy with all these people surrounding you. The Dakota drill or whatever. Oh, yeah, the Oklahoma Oklahoma, drill, which is two offensive, three offensive linemen, two defensive linemen, you and a running back, two bags about, you know, four yards apart. And they just say, you know, hike. And all you might as well just line up in front of a cinder block wall and hit it. I, I can't tell you how many concussions I had in training camp. Today, they don't hit very much in practice. Back then, we hit twice a day in practice for 32 straight days. We, I think we would got one day off, off a week. Um, I, I can't even guesstimate. Was that 2,000 concussions in practice? Was it 800? I don't know. All I know is it was a lot and... Um, 
what happened was, uh, you know, if, if anyone's ever, you know, not worked out for a long time and then they suddenly you know, maybe go try to run uh, five miles or lift weights really hard, you're going to be sore for a few days. Well, the same kind of thing happens in football. Once the season starts, the older you get, you used to recover around Tuesday. You're ready to go for practice on Wednesday. But at 38 years old, which I was my last year, I never recovered. Once the season started, you were sore until the season ended. Mm. And I noticed probably two or three years before I retired that I would have headaches almost all season long. And then those headaches would continue for a few weeks after the season. And by my last year, they never stopped. And it was 12 to 15 years, I can't remember now, with this slight, it started out as slight tapping on the back of the head. And then it would be like somebody just kind of punching you about that hard on the back of the head. Constantly. And constantly. And I only knew when I didn't have one, which was rarely. And, um, you know, in alongside of that was the insomnia. So sleeping three hours, two and a half hours at a time, then being up for two or three hours. And then that cycle uh, Any made depression things. with it or then the depression. That's what started happening after um, Junior Seau committed suicide. So can you understand to a degree like if Junior's condition was as bad as yours or worse, can you understand why he did what he did? Absolutely. I think there are a lot of people out there uh, that, you know, might be judgmental or holier than thou. Yeah, I and would never take my own life. I would never do absolutely. that. Absolutely. And what I want people to understand about it, because I actually got to that point eventually, is that... You thought when, about taking your own life? Yes. And when you get to that point where... I couldn't get out of bed sometimes for two or three days at a time. Um, you know, the constant throbbing headaches. Um, what starts to happen is is you're, you're not getting any joy out of life because, you know, really laying in bed for two or three days with a headache that has, has not stopped for a decade um, it was, it was difficult. It was, a uh, I, the analogy I make is it felt like I was falling down into a well and then it became a bottomless well. Cause you know, I guess if you're falling down a 40 foot well, you can see the opening. It gets to that point where that opening, that light gets smaller and smaller and smaller where you literally know I'm not getting out of here. And so, um, the day that Junior took his own life, um, I was sitting there doing cardio at my house and my wife came home. Uh, she actually left work early because she knew that it was going to impact me. Sitting on my recumbent bike, tears just flowing. And this is four hours after it had been announced. And So you were doing cardio and you saw it on the news? Yep. Yeah. Uh, NBC. And... Um, I, I, I see it and I'm just devastated. I had seen Junior about eight days before at a charity golf event. We now know that J Junior probably tried to commit suicide about a month and a half before in that the car. in the car when he ran off the road. And so when I saw him, um, I had been trying to call him and he wasn't answering. But when I saw him at this charity event, just like typical Junior, he surrounded by five, 10 people. And so I wait for them to disperse and I went up and hugged him and, and I'm like, you know, Hey bro, how are you? And he said, I'm good. I'm good. He'd call everybody buddy. Cause you don't remember everyone's name. So that was his deal. You know, Hey buddy. And I, you know, I heard all this. So I, so I wait for him and I said, bug, this is me. He called him June, June bug or, or June. And, uh, I said, dude, this is me. I know what's going on. I just want you to know you've got a place that you can go if if you need to talk, um, if you need to escape, if you need to get away from the media. Um, I, I want you to call me. He's like, bro, I'm good. I promise you. I promise. And I actually thought, okay, I, I'm okay. Because I, I wasn't sleeping just thinking about what he had done the month and a half before 
And so when it happened, you feel so guilty. Like, wh- why? Why did he do this and, and I didn't? You know, there were extenuating circumstances with Junior. Now what I know happens with these concussions is it takes synaptic connections in your brain and it bruises them to the point where what used to be a gap like this and, you know, electrical impulses can still pass between those synaptic connections. They're now like this and they're not talking to each other anymore. And so things that were once simple in your life, problems in your life, the ability to solve, to handle emotions, you know, no big deal. Well, now in order to get for me, for example, I couldn't change a doorknob. Remember, I worked with my brother in construction mm-hmm. for three years, and then we did bathroom and kitchen remodels for another three years after that. I could remodel a house. I couldn't change a doorknob, Clark. And I was so fr- I can remember just throwing it against the wall and putting a big old hole in the wall that I had to dry pa- drywall <laughs> patch. Um, it's the most frustrating thing because you're not you anymore. And you know that when you overreact to something with your wife or your kids or your girlfriend, this isn't me. And now you start this this self-loathing. You don't even like who you are, but you don't know why. But here's the thing with guys in the military and guys playing professional football or at a high level in sport. You're too proud to look for help. And guess what? You've got... A, a, an S on your chest and a cape on your back because you had to, you had to be the toughest guy on the field and you had to be the toughest guy in, in your troop. You know, I, I mean, that's just the way it is. And if you're not tough, you're, you're out of here. So you're not going to tell anyone, you know, right here was just one of my 23 surgeries. This was 27 places. My wrist was shattered in. I played three weeks later, Clark, mm. with a giant cast. Um, two six-inch pens put in this thumb on Tuesday. Surgery. I played on Sunday. I'm going to start bitching and complaining because I have a little headache? No. And so you get so good at disguising because all the way back when, drill sergeants, coaches telling you, just rub a little dirt on it. You'll be fine. Tape an aspirin to it. You'll be fine you realize, okay, people revere this and you don't want anyone to think that you're not tough. And so you don't let anyone know. Do you know who knows? Your wife, your girlfriend. Listen to that female voice, your mother, that female voice in your life. I've said, I've said it a bunch of times that I think more like a woman now than I ever have in my life and I'm proud of it. Because women get the emotions that that we don't get. We spend so much time trying to be macho and and brave and whatever that, you know, you you don't have to be. A lot of times we think that's who we're supposed to be. So um, my wife told me, you need to go get help. And so uh, she went with me to see a counselor, a family counselor. And the first thing that person did is say, we're going to get you into yoga. <laughs> and my wife was totally on board. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, you've got to be effing kidding me. I love weights. I'm a yeah, player. exactly. I, you know what? Because any problem I ever had in my life before, Clark, I'm not running around it. I'm running through it. And that's the disconnect, you know, is that... Women have a way of skirting around the edges and softening things where we're numbskulls and would rather beat our head against the wall. It doesn't always work. And and I think that's really been a powerful thing for me to learn. So I'll take you to my first yoga session. Oh, my God. I, I'm looking at my one. I got to get out of here. This is crazy. And it was core power yoga. And it's taught by the you know people that are doing a great job. And. I get finished in Shavasana at the very end where you got to lay down and do these breathing exercises. And I'm doing the hoo-hoo, and I'm doing the breathing exercise. But then I said, okay, I, I actually really need to do this. So, you know, deep breath in and hold. 
Deep breath out and hold box breathing. 30 seconds later, for about 30 seconds, my headache went away. Hmm. That's a coincidence. Okay, no big deal. But I promised my wife I'd go back the next day. I go back the next day. I do the yoga again. I suck at it, but Shavasana at the very end. I get a, remember, I've had a headache for whatever, 10, 12, 14 years. I get a, about a two minute respite from a headache. Hmm. So, literally, at the end of this first week that I'd promised that I'd go, I was up to five minutes at a time. And it happened a couple of times throughout the day that the headache went away. And it was, crazy to me that that had happened. I signed up for a year and that was the start of the journey. And again, surrounding yourself with good people. Steve Young has a foundation, the Forever Young Foundation, just so happened to be doing a charity event where I go, they build dedicated music centers in children's hospitals because they found that music can help kids heal after their surgery. So I talked to some of the people that that run the program, some doctors, and saying, hey, it's great for this, this, and this. And I said, okay, maybe I should start listening to classical music. So I did. And Steve Young Foundation, again, this one happened to be up in Park City, Utah, uh, helping wounded warriors uh, get back out on the slopes and talking to some of those guys and and. You know, I took some techniques from those guys and it was just this thing where I I found that if I listen to people that have had some of these same experiences, I'm going to find some relief for me, you know, figuring out that that gardening was one of my areas. So if I garden while listening to classical music, I feel better. Uh, If I start doing yoga in my steam shower while I have CBD uh, and essential oils in the diffuser, I feel better. And, And so it's just been these micro increments that have added up uh, to huge gains over the years. It's really interesting to me how it's the complete opposite of who you were Mm and what your identity was steeped into. And you were smart enough to listen to your wife who basically saved your life and said, take the cape off. Absolutely. Take the cape off. Trust me because I know you better than anyone. I love you more than anyone. And I'm concerned with you more than anyone. So follow my lead and come with me and go do this. And you were smart enough to understand because the trauma that you experienced with a dear friend that you didn't want to follow in those footsteps. And you went and did this stuff. And I really love what you're doing now. And we joked about the fact that I think you should have a TV show where you talk about these things and how, you know, you're planting succulents on a slope. I've seen the photos of that. You've transformed so many people's yards and mine included every single person (laughs) that pulls into my house. And I need you to see it now because it looks so beautiful. It's just robust with color, the fire sticks, and all of these different things. And I hear your voice in my head when you say, Clark, you need to take that one out from under there because eventually it's going to grow up into it and it's going to be a big cluster. And I went and I did that. And now I'm doing, me and Anita are doing what you do. You take all of these overgrowths and things that people would throw away or that people pay a lot of money for at Home Depot and Lowe's. And you could bless somebody with this because you understand how calming it is, how beautiful it is, how much joy people get from something as simple as a succulent. It's really weird, man. And and it's a great kind of, you know, ending to this whole conversation about how you take a really tough man who lived in a really tough sport, made a living and learned some really tough lessons and transitioned that into a really beautiful future. And I'm just so grateful to have you as a friend and I'm blessed to learn from you and grow from you. I'm about to cry right now, but uh, this is real. This is real people. And I want you to understand that every person I bring in here, I respect the hell out of, and I want you to listen, man, not just turn on another podcast, but listen to the message 
that is being said because there are so many layers. We could literally sit here the entire rest of the day, but at some point we have to cut this off because I realize your attention span is probably limited. <laughs> we'll have Gary back again, but I want to give Gary the last words in saying, and then also if, you, if you're on social media, I know you don't get on there all that much, but if you want anyone to follow you, maybe you have some input there that you could continue to pour into them. But final words, final thoughts that you have for people. Yeah, no social media for me. Okay. Um, what I would love to say is I owe my life to my wife and Junior Seau. And I'm about to cry as well because the players in today's NFL should be thanking Junior Seau because he forced the NFL to change the rules. And um, it's not like they care any more than they used to. They were forced to. It's all. It's a business. It's about making money, and that's that's okay. But uh, the players that are playing today probably won't have the long term repercussions that somebody like Junior had that played the game for twenty years. That's unbelievable. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely owe my life uh, to those two people and um, feel totally blessed. You know, it's funny that when someone takes their life a lot of times people say it's selfish but when I look back on Junior and what he did and you know this better than anyone it wasn't selfish it was a sacrifice it really was because the way he did it he thought about absolutely the long term like how can I just what you said yeah. how can I help the rest of these kids yeah. that are coming out of college played 18 games, going into an arena that they know nothing about, yeah. getting paid a lot of money to be good at something, but they're going to get beat up along the way. And the way he did it, is, as you're explaining, is he didn't shoot himself like most people do in the head. He shot himself in the heart so that his brain could be studied. And um, clearly they found that there was a tremendous amount of CTE in, in his brain. Think about the irony of that. The yeah. heart is what made that man who he was, yeah. who he is who yeah. will continue to be, man. Yeah. Wow. All right, we're going to stop there. <sighs> Let's take a deep breath. Let's do a little box breathing before we end this to lift up the energy <laughs> and the mood because the idea is, man, for us to feel good when we watch yes. this show. So, Gary, lead us through a little box breathing right so now. So, when we box breathe, it is, it is to breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold for se four seconds, come down, breathe in for four seconds, Breathe out for four seconds. So here we go. Breathe in. Hold. Breathe out. Hold. You can breathe now. I don't want you to. I don't want you to stop totally and <laughs> stop your heart. But you just keep doing those, yeah. you know, that box breathing. Yeah. And that's actually something I didn't realize this, but they're taught that at the Navy SEAL, at BUDS, when they're out there in the water, when, as they say, there's nothing worse than the cold except for the sand that gets in your crotch and and, and, and yeah and your and your that that's just grinding and and you're you're raw by the end of buds and uh, but they teach the box breathing so that you can have um, mind over matter i'm gonna do a whole show on breathing but with that being said thank you for tuning in today and if you want to follow me i'm at clark bartram on instagram the real clark bartram on tiktok and as always, I want you to get busy living and make it a great day.